Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we discuss news information and emerging thought with leaders from across the healthcare industry. This is episode number 12. It's Friday, March 30th. Today, Apple expands their move into healthcare. Is this finally the moment we've all been waiting for? <laughs> An important discussion about gender pay equity within healthcare IT and the priorities of the CIO. This podcast is brought to you by Health Lyrics, a leader in moving healthcare to the cloud. To learn more, visit healthlyrics.com. My name is Bill Russell, recovering healthcare CIO, writer, and consultant with the previously mentioned Health Lyrics. Today, I'm joined by one of the leading voices in consumer digital transformation, who is a visionary and pragmatic. It's one of the one of one of the things I love about her, and it's a wonderful combination. Today, I'm excited to have this the California market CIO for healthcare partners. Uh, Sarah Richardson, join us. And, and so when I say healthcare partners, do I have to always say healthcare partners, a part of the Vita Medical Group? Is that like taboo not to say those together? No, we are currently healthcare partners, A to V to medical group until our close with Optum, in which case we will then have probably a new level of branding. But for now, that is how we like to uh, coin ourselves. So that's yeah. that's something we have in common. So we've, we're both, I've, I've gone through a big merger and that's why I'm a former CIO and you're going through a, a merger now and that's that's a pretty exciting time I, I, are you getting a feel for what it's going to be like in the in the new in the new order or new world that you're entering yeah no absolutely and it's funny because what i love about this whole experience right now is that all of us that are in the it leadership role within davita medical group and doing this work we all say this is not our first rodeo none <laughs> of us has not been somewhere else before and so us collectively being able to come together and create that new structure and future for our existing teams it brings a lot of confidence to the organization because we've all done it before. Uh, and more importantly, we're all excited about doing it because you, every time you do one of these, you learn. Uh, I helped one of my friends through a big merger acquisition recently. In fact, I wrote an article a couple of years ago about how to maintain employee engagement during a merger and acquisition. And he called me and said, I can't tell my teammates what I want to say. Will you write an article about what I want to say to them? And I'll just <laughs> give you content. So I interviewed him and wrote the piece and it was a, it was a huge win on, on both parts. And so, you know, either we've done it ourselves or done it with others. And so when you, it, every time it gets better, um, and this one's just really unique because of the size and the scope and the level of professionalism that's tied to it. Yeah. Optum, Optum's a great company. We could actually do a whole podcast on handling mergers and acquisitions. There's so much going on in healthcare and people want to know, how do I navigate my career through this thing? So yeah. maybe after, after we go through this merger, we'll have you back on and we'll, we'll talk about that. Let me, let me give you some of your, uh, let me give you some of your bio. Let me give the, <laughs> the listeners some of the, some of the bio. So Kansas City Business Journal says a uh, woman who may, uh, uh, noted you as a woman who means business, a next gen leader and a rising star. Um, I mean, those are some great accolades, uh, BS in hospitality administration and masters in business. That's a good combination for where healthcare is going. Uh, Sarah spent six years in the hotel and casino industry in Las Vegas before making a purposeful decision that she could uh, make a larger impact on health on the healthcare industry. So I sort of happened into healthcare and then fell in love with it. You actually stepped back and said, "There's a place where I can make a difference," and chose to go into healthcare. I, talk to us a little bit about how you how you made that move. Yes, you know, it's, it's interesting because everything always comes full circles, we like to say, in our lives. So I was, and I still, to this day, I love the hospitality industry, and I'm spending more and more time doing more, uh, I think I call them side gigs, and, and, and speaking, and, and consulting, and life coaching, and whatnot, with a lot of hospitality uh, professionals that I know. But I was in the hospital, or hotel business, and I was young enough that working, you know, seven days a week, 90 hours a week, and opening these mega resorts was not a big deal. It was kind of a thing to do. But I also reached a point in my life where I wanted to start to understand what work-life balance meant. And I knew that I would have to do something different. So two things were the catalyst, though. It wasn't like I just woke up and said, I want to be more purposeful in healthcare. Um, I was working for an airline that was a startup. And we all went there. It was in Las Vegas. We knew that it was a good chance it could go bankrupt. So I started going to grad school while I was there because I knew that I was going to need to have the next level of education. Well, while I'm going to grad school, they went bankrupt. And I'm like, okay, now what? Well, I happened to be in my primary study group in grad school was a guy who worked uh, at the county hospital. And he would always tell me about doing IT in the hospitals and, and the, the, the choices that they had to make because it was an indigent care facility and they never had any money, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, well, wow, you, know, you can really start to bring these things together. So in a nutshell, hospitality is really healthcare and hotel. They don't run very differently. And that used to bother people when I said, that a, ho a hospital runs a lot like a casino. 
they'd be like, oh, but there's patients here. I, I get that the missions are slightly different, trust me, but you still have food services and HVAC and facilities and IT. And I mean, you have all the same components. It's just a different core competency that runs them. Um, but I'll tell you, I think my first love will always be hospitality. It's now being able to bring those two worlds consistently together. And here I am 18 years later in healthcare and the patient experience is the big thing. Um, and it really does resonate. Uh, I don't know if I was smart or lucky, maybe a little bit of combination of both. I won't tell you that at 19 and 22, I was, I was really strategically thinking about what I was going to be doing in 25 years. Yeah, no, that's, um, yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. And the two are very similar. I've, I've, I've seen that in terms of the way you describe a hospital and how it's similar to, you know, it has beds, it has rooms, it has yeah. uh, it just a whole bunch of those kinds of services. Is there anything you're working on? We typically, every uh, new guest we ask, you know, is there anything you're working on that you're excited about that you, that you want to share with us? Sure. I have to just be transparent and twofold. Number one, we are actively working towards what we call day one readiness for our close with Optum. And there's just a huge, we've been a part of of Davida Kidney Care for over five years. It's been a phenomenal relationship, but after five years, you share a lot of systems. And so there's a lot of separation and a lot of activities to occur to make sure that, because here's the deal, like anything IT related, the day after close, phones need to work, servers need to work, people expect a paycheck, all the logistics yeah. that go into all the back end type of planning. So really excited about the day one writing this, making sure all of our systems work, that all of our teammates are aligned appropriately. So that's part's really cool. And the, and then corollary, we're still running our local business. We're doing a lot in the population health sector, we're doing a lot with utilization management, a lot with transition of care, clinician and physician experience, quality. Those all continue to be just the things at the forefront. And uh, I'm most excited about some work we've really been able to accomplish recently in transitions of care. We completely took a homegrown care management system and flipped it into a, an industry system that is already like reaping massive amounts of rewards in our ability to not only care for our patients, but provide a, an environment where our teammates can be at, do their best work. Yeah, I, and I skipped over this in your bio, but um, uh, Davida has our uh, healthcare partners have 600,000 managed care patients, and I know a lot of hospitals would love to replicate that that model, and 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 that gives you a leg up on the on the popula population health side. Um, all right, so we've got to get to the show. This is uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, you ready? So here's what we do. I pick a story, you'll pick a story, and we'll just go back and forth. So I'll start us off. The uh, big news actually came out yesterday. We actually had different stories picked out at the beginning of the week, and then yesterday happened, and a uh, big announcement. 13 hospitals that partnered with Apple around their personal medical record has now become 39 hospitals, and that's a big deal. It means it's, it's starting to get some, um, starting to get some uh, momentum. I'm not going to talk about it. There's, there's a bunch of places you can read about that. Healthcare IT News is, is uh, the story I looked at. But the story I'm going to focus in on is, um, is a story from the Harvard Business Review that has uh, last week's guest, Anish Chopra and David Blumenthal, uh, both very active uh, in this movement and in the government. And they talk about Apple's pact with 13 healthcare systems might actually disrupt the healthcare industry. And let, let me just give you a couple of things here. Uh, it could be it could herald truly disruptive change in the U.S. healthcare system. The reason it could liberate the reason is it could liberate healthcare data for game changing game changing new uses, including empowering patients as never before. And they go on to talk about um, a world in which patients have access to their data and they can now sh share it. If people want to hear more about that, Anish and I talked about it last week, and Sushay and I talked about it a couple uh, when it first came out. The 13 health systems that this really could be a game changer. So they gave us, um, uh, you know, why it can be a, a game changer in terms of liberating the data. They also gave us some obstacles. And the first obstacle they get, gave us, and this was before the announcement, was a large number of hospitals and doctors have to follow the lead of the 13 systems. And it seems like, hey, we're over that first obstacle. The mm -hmm. second one is the opportunities for fraud and abuse. And we, we obviously, that's still a daunting task, and we have to figure that out. And then the third is once new companies start to develop consumer-facing applications, everything's going to depend on the quality of those applications, but I have a lot of confidence in that area. The second one's going to be a little harder. I guess my question to you is, are we finally at the starting line? Is it, does this Apple announcement going from 13 to 39, are we finally at the starting line for this uh, consumer revolution within healthcare? Or are we, are we still being a little over, overly optimistic? Anything Apple does has hype. I mean, come on, that's what they're known for. But I think about, we have, so one of the things I love about Apple is they talk about, it needs to be simple, it needs to be elegant, it needs to be easy. You think about how they, they've historically always designed their products. 
And I laugh because we, we, in my house, we're a house divided. It's either an Android house or it's an Apple house. It's this constant battle. And yet I can't imagine my life without my Apple products. And it's not because I'm an evangelist for Apple. It's that everything I do revolves around my Apple products, my MacBook, my iPad, my iPhone. I'd be more upset if I couldn't find my iPad than like my shoes in the morning because I live my entire life on that device. In fact, that's how we're communicating right yeah, now. Yeah, and you do that because they're easy. Are they, if, are they going to be able to take that easy, the easy yeah. button and move it into healthcare? That, I guess that's the question. They will, so long as Apple's able to uh, continue to push, and we, we overhype again the whole interoperability and this, that, and the other thing. When you look at your, if you go to your Apple phone and you go to HealthKit, your information's already there. It's already telling you the things that you're doing. So long as the EMR vendors, so long as the third-party applications that allow themselves to connect into HealthKit, like even today, I use Vitality at work and some other things, they're all connected to HealthKit already. Yeah. So as long as we continue to make sharing that information easy, um, then yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, Apple already has all of our information. What's the difference if they also have our health information now and simulate that information to make it easier to share? It'll be interesting how to get that information back out of HealthKit. So if I go, if I go see you, as a patient and you're a specialist that has no history with me and all my information's on my phone, we have to make it easy and at my discretion to give you the information in my phone to you if you're somehow not then connected into the Apple ecosystem yet. Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, so that's going to be the key. And, and I've written a couple articles about this. And, um, you know, the thing is, if, if we're able to push the easy button, if we're able to walk into that clinic that we've never been to before. And with our iPhone, you know, just do the, the Apple Pay thing, except it's, uh, you know, our health record going over. And all of a sudden, we, we, we're not handed a clipboard. They have our information, we're checked in, we get to the doctor and he's actually, even though we haven't been there before, he or she is looking at our entire, the clinician has our entire medical record. And maybe not our entire medical record, but at least uh, the parts that are gonna be uh, relevant for for that initial visit. They may need to request images, they may need to request other aspects uh, because, I mean, the, the idea today of having the entire medical record on the phone is probably a little far-fetched, but probably not in the future. I mean, we should be able to get to this common record that sort of moves around with you. It's sort of like the, uh, for lack of a better term, it's sort of like the common app. I'm taking my daughter to look at uh, colleges and they have this common app that the various uh, colleges share. And if we can get to that common framework for enough hospitals, uh, we are going to make this uh, help. It's going to be a lot of things, right? So it's not only Apple bringing the, the easy button in the ecosystem, it's also going to be the health systems doing the heavy lift on creating that framework, that data, and the federal government, they're doing some things around that as well. I it's this is going to be interesting to me. I think, I think this is the beginning. I think this is the start. I think Apple has finally gotten to the starting line. I think uh, Amazon is really close to getting to the starting line with their with their announcement and the things that they're going to be doing. Um, I, I think we're we're right on the cusp of a, a huge digital uh, transformation. Um, it'll be interesting to see how CIOs how CIOs sort of address that. So you have you have a story, and I, I I'm looking forward to this to this conversation. Yeah. So uh, do you want me to continue on the Apple path, or uh, you, you, if you have more to say on the Apple path, by all means. But then then feel free to kick it to your whenever you're ready. Kick it to your your other story. Yeah, I think just briefly as we, as we close the Apple thought is that when you think about having your information on your phone, it's important for you. Like you start doing your genetic testing. And I remember being at the patient experience conference last year for Southern California Hems, and that one of the gentlemen presenting talked about having his 23andMe profile done. And when he was out of town and he was injured and a physician wanted to prescribe to him a blood thinner, he said, hey, based on my genetic profile, it's actually not going to be a good fit for my treatment. He also happens to be a physician, so that was a relevant conversation. Right. But I think about my, my mom, who's in her late 70s, and for her to have her information on her phone or for me to have her information on, on the phone, it's key as you start to have elder care or if you have children, you know your own history, but to be able to really be tracking what's happening in your family, because most of us have the proxy for our parents as they get older. Um, and it's fallacy to think that they're not using their phones. I mean, she's got Alexa tied into her phone and anything. So I'm already thinking Amazon and Apple are already part of her, her everyday ecosystem. That's, that's common for all of us. I mean, we live our lives around about four major players out there. 
including Facebook and Amazon and Google and Apple. I mean, that's kind of our lives today. It makes sense that they help us start to manage our care. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know one of the things that uh, like, sort of hit me this last week, and I, and I like to go out and find a cool article almost every day and then post it on LinkedIn and Twitter and, and see what kind of traction we get, what people are caring about, what's resonating. And it continues to be this whole thing about gender equality and, and how you get to, um, get, it's called getting to equal. And Accenture put out an article recently. What I loved about it is they interviewed 22,000 people in 34 countries. So it wasn't just a myopic view of what we're doing in America. And they talked about getting to equal and what those drivers were. And they talked about bold leadership being one of them, um, how you need to provide diversity. Um, you share your targets for employment. You share, you communicate pay gaps. Um, and that's what, one of the things I loved right there. Imagine if, because I used to work for, um, I've worked twice for nonprofits. Your salary is published. Right. Why don't we do that in, across the board? I mean, if everybody's salary was published in an organization, it would remove so many walls that we have. It might, it's, and a lot of people go, oh no, it's going to create all kinds of consternation. People are going to be focused on how much people make versus how much they do. Once it becomes commonplace, and think about the think about the level of accountability when you say, I make X, I need to prove that I'm worth making X. It's not just because I'm a man or a woman or years of experience or whatever, that your worth is really tied to your performance. And it's something that is publicly published. I've always loved that. I think the same thing about titles. Remember the guy who invented Gore-Tex? Nobody had titles. You called yourself whatever you wanted. They didn't have titles. They just, they were just, everybody got the job done. Um, but one of the things that they talked about in the Accenture article as well is, how they recruit, retain, advance women networks um, specifically, but they also have networks for men and women. So they don't just focus on programs only for what women are doing. Um, and then I love the piece about if you want to create a culture of equality, everybody gets the same level of parental leave. So why should a female be the one taking six, 12 weeks off for, you know, for having a new baby? Um, it's just as important in some cases, um, if not more so for the, the father to be able to take that time. With their child as well because they don't always get the same amount of time off um, and we don't make it easy uh, financially for people to always do that yeah and what I loved is being empowered to i love this wear what they want to work we get to wear jeans two days a week i'm a huge proponent for wearing jeans three days a week and i say anybody who doesn't who doesn't think it's professional i might go put on a pencil skirt and three or four inch heels and tell me which day is more comfortable for you to operate y'all get to wear the same thing every day and people say oh sir you can wear pants every day yeah i could but you don't want to see me in a pair of doctor dockers. It's just not awesome. You know, it's just like this, you still have this brand or this image. And so allow people to look how they want to look and feel how they want to feel. Cause that's when you bring your best self forward. When you're just authenticity is really the driver behind some of the things you're doing. Yeah. It's a, it's uh, man, there's so many things I could jump off of on that, <laughs> but I, I do want to highlight another story on the same topic. So, um, Let's see, uh, you did the Forbes story. Here it is. Uh, so Corn Ferry Institute did a story on February 8th, the breakthrough formula of women CEOs. That's a really great story because they, they highlight story, uh, about six, six different female CEOs and their, their rise to the top and how they got there. And I, you know, I'll just highlight one of them. So uh, Jackie Hinman, CEO of, um, I think I'm going to say this right, CH2M Hill. Uh, early in her engineering career, shortly out of college, Hinman sat down with senior manager for an end-of-year performance review. When he told her to write down her career goals, Hinman answered honestly she wanted to be a partner at the firm. The manager, who she believes was well-intentioned, said, there's no doubt that she had the prowess, but this office was never, or, yeah, this office was never going to have a female partner in her lifetime. So he passed the bottle of correction fluid to give you gives you the time frame of it, you know, the whiteout uh, across the desk and told told the eager employee to write something that didn't make her look naive. And uh, it goes on to say the daughter of Italian immigrants who grew up next door to grandparents and romantic notions of the American dream, Hinman started looking for a new job the next day following her review. And when she saw that, uh, saw that man many years later, she said, thank you. Uh, I knew that he was right. I couldn't make partner there, uh, not at that company. And I, you know, it's interesting because I think, at least in this story, and I think really across the board, every every woman has that kind of story in in their career of saying, you know, you can't make it to this level or whatnot. And we look across the board, and the number of female CEOs is is uh, still dramatically lower uh, than their their male counterparts. And, and these kinds of stories and whatnot need to need to stop. And 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 actually, your story notes it's just bad for business. Yeah. Not 
not promoting um, people within the organization and having diversity of thought, diversity of background and experience, it's just bad for business. Um, but, uh, you know, with that being said, I wanted to get a little bit more pragmatic because in my, in my experience, um, this whole idea of pay equity is a almost a person by person situation. And it really impacts all people. If we published everybody's salary, people would be upset, but a lot of it's their own fault in terms, and I'm not saying, look, I, I, I want to be real clear here. There is, there is a, a, a gender issue here and it needs to be addressed. There's a cultural issue that needs to be addressed, but it takes some time. So if we want to be pragmatic and talk about it, let's talk about some of the problems that exist within companies. One is, um, you know, we shouldn't assume that we're going to be able to make our way to the top through a single company. And there's three things at work to keep that from happening. One is HR won't allow it. I know that's going to sound interesting, but HR won't allow you to progress through the company. Let me give you an example. I was hiring for a VP role, and we had external candidates and we had internal candidates. The, the role had a range, and the external candidates, it came down to two candidates, one internal, one external. The range was going to be right around $200,000 for a VP, $6 billion company. So, um, so the external candidate, I went to HR and I said, well, it's 200,000, but the, the current, the internal candidate's making 150 and I want to pay him 200. And they said, you can't do that. But I could hire the external candidate at 200. It made no sense. I'm like, well, I don't understand. They're like, well, the most you can give is a 20% pay increase. You can take them to, to 180, but you can't take them to 200. And, and so HR policies need to be looked at in terms of if somebody is qualified for the role and you're going to go externally and hire somebody, mm -hmm. you know, HR needs to allow for that kind of promotion within. I'll say the other thing is the culture won't allow it. My daughter is, is working at Sephora. She's just starting out and she's moving up in management. I hope she doesn't listen to the podcast. Um, but one of the harder things is she went from being a peer to being a manager of those same people. The culture is very difficult on that. And so sometimes it's easier to, to go to a different store or go to a different uh, location. Uh, and the second thing is experience won't allow it. A lot of times organizations aren't good at and need to get better at allowing people to get experience in a lot of different areas. And yeah. they hesitate to move people around because we brought you in as the data person or we brought you in as the EMR person. And in order to get to those sea levels, I think you just need to have a breadth of experiences that most organizations um, just don't allow. So uh, I think the last thing I would say to people on, on this thing is you have to be willing to move. Mm -hmm. My three biggest pay increases, my three biggest uh, job title moves uh, are uh, things equated to me moving my family to a new location. And... Uh, and, and actually, all the leaders, uh, uh, Deborah Proctor was the CEO at St. Joseph Health, and she talks about the story of she moved several times for very good career moves, very good pay increases, and that's what it takes in order to get, sometimes to get to that C level. So I, I throw all those things out just to be a little bit more pragmatic. I do recognize that the, these stories of, hey, take the white out, you know, you're never going to make it. There is a, that's, that's, that stuff just needs to end. But there's also some things that people just mistakes and ways people are thinking about money and the negotiations. I think that are that are causing them some challenges. I'll let you close close this segment out. Every every example you're giving, I'm thinking yes, this and yes, this and yes, this happened over here and yes, this happened over here. You know, I think what's most uh, it's, it's hard for people that um, that don't want to be as mobile, and I say that because I've moved. Uh, what five times in twelve years now, uh, right. for for various companies, and um, my family knows that this is probably not our last move. And I'm saying this with my employer, like listening, saying, "Are you leaving? Whatever." No, that's not what I mean. But let's be honest. I'm going to be working for a at the end of the day, a Fortune six company um, whose headquarters are not in Los Angeles. And so you always have a choice of where you want to live, but you also have a choice of taking certain roles based on geography a lot of time. And you have to make sure those line up with what you want to do. Um, I was, I, if you had told me even 15 years ago that you're going to go live in four more States and all these things are going to happen. I don't know that I would have believed that was a true statement. Um, and I left someplace that I loved to go someplace that geographically, geographically I didn't love. And yet it was the best decision I ever made in my career. And once I got there, I created an entire life and had a wonderful time. And so 
you just have to be open to the fact that you can create your life and, and your career and anywhere that you live, but you're right. Um, I always joke that people never leave their companies for less money. And, and it's sad that sometimes you have to, but when, as long as we continue to have that level of transparency, Bill, when people say, because people do exit interviews, why are you leaving? I'm leaving because I don't like my manager. I'm leaving because it's too hard to get things done. Most of the time, people are going to also leave because they have an opportunity for a title and money that no one would recognize them for in the organization that they're in today. And right. that's a sad fact, both male and female. And I see it happen often, really in healthcare, because you want to talk about a place that people poach like crazy. Um, we all move around and the first phone call you get is, hey, I'm at such and such, do you want to come work with me? And, and quite often, if you built a strong following, people will move for you. Yeah, I'll tell you, to, just to close this out, the, the, the last thing I think is nuts is when hiring managers, I've had hiring managers come in and, and they negotiate with new employees like they're, they're buying a new product and they're like, hey, I got the lowest price. They need to change that, that mindset. It needs to be, uh, you're negotiating to have them feel the best about the company and the best about the culture and, and the best about themselves. And so they're, when you're negotiating there, it's not to get the best price, it's to how do you get to the point where they feel good about what just happened, that they, they're coming into a company that cares about them, that values them. I've had people say to me, you know, I wanna make 65,000 a year, and I looked at them and said, okay, we're gonna pay you 75. And they feel great about themselves, because yeah. you know, quite frankly, I hope everybody can make the maximum amount they can make, and that little thing there is a story that they will tell their parents, they will tell their family, they will tell their, you know, and, and they're gonna be like, this company cares about me, this company, you know, I asked for this, they gave me this, and somebody might look at me and say, hey, that was irresponsible with the company's money. Was it, really? I mean, you now have an a, a, a energized employee who, who loves the company, and, you know, quite frankly, in, when you're looking at the kind of budgets we're looking at, you know, that $10,000, that was a really good investment um, in terms of culture. All right, I'm sorry. So we'll, <laughs> we still No, we can talk all day on, on those topics, which is good. We generate we, conversation. We could. So we, we've cut this topic short. So let's talk about CIO priorities. The Beckers did a, a story. They interviewed some people and they said, we're uh, CIO spending too much time or over investing. And here are some of the things I'll just, we'll go back and forth real quick on some of these. They said uh, they're spending too much time right now on blockchain. And a couple of them came up with this. Do you think we're spending too much time there today? Yeah. Um, we, well, we are. No, it's not that we're spending too much time. We're getting distracted. People get, people see their, oh, how do I say this? I see a lot of industry professionals looking to think, uh, show that they're ahead of the curve or that they're yep. forward thinking or this and that because they're talking about machine learning and natural language processing and AI and blockchain and this and that. And it, it's great to be informed. And that's the purpose of being tied to the agencies that we are. That's why we go to things like, you know, hymns and chime events because we want to know what's out there. But at the end of the day, how many of us are going back and working on our blockchain and AI strategy within organizations. Probably none of us, unless you're really fortunate to have some of that funding. I mean, I will tell you right now, I'm my <laughs> this week, my biggest challenge was how do I get four buildings moved and opened at the same time with 10 desktop technicians? I mean, I'm not kidding you that no, I, sometimes, I, so that's the reality. Like I literally had the conversation of, I have a hard hat from, from a previous lifetime of construction of IT projects. If I have to go to the site this weekend because we have temporary certification of occupancy and carry PCs up the stairs because the elevators aren't working yet, guess what? That's what I get to go do and I'm okay with that because I can then pivot to, oh, hey, here's a new distributed, distributed general ledger opportunity for us to make sure that we're more secure in the world. But yeah. um, we focus on appearing uh, industry relevant, which is important. But I think sometimes we forget about the blocking and tackling that's happening in terms of um, razor thin margins on on what CMS reimbursement is really doing and and how do we really eke out that next level of quality? How do we we're like we're partnering with our health plans to understand how important medication adherence is for certain disease states? Because when you get multiple comorbidities, you're more likely to have behavioral health and mental health issues. And those are the patients that are most likely to get admitted to the hospital and have the hardest time for a safer recovery. And so it's not always it's the blocking and tackling at all levels that um, may not be as, as sexy to talk about. So yeah, I can have a blockchain conversation, but when I'm in the office, I'm really having a conversation about medication adherence. 
Wow. Okay. So I'm not. So let me give uh, just yes, no on this. Are we spending too much time on an internal data where uh, internal uh, enterprise data warehouse and big data strategies? Are we spending too much time there or not enough time? It depends. Because if you have a, <laughs> you have a warehouse, make sure it's clean and providing necessary relevant data, but at the most routine level that it needs to. Let it provide base level important information now versus data lakes of information. Make sure the data you have is usable and clean. Yep. Absolutely. So are we spending too much time on the EHR? Yes. Are we spending too much time on population health? It depends. So I would say yes, if you don't have an ability where you can manage, manage risk lives appropriately and have a strategy really defined. Because if you don't have the ability to manage the entire uh, risk population, the entire journey of that patient's uh, continuum of care, then you're going to be in a, in a sticky wicket. Agree. So, yeah, and you mentioned AI and machine learning. Are we spending too much time there, or just we're just talking about it now? We're not really spending a lot of time on projects. Um, we're talking about it. Uh, in some cases, it's there. Like when you look at being able to bring Alexa into the patient room and and be able to take some of that time off of nurses and say, "Hey, I need a blanket. Hey, I need to use the restroom." There are some cool use cases, but it goes back to again, it's those uh, Maslow's needs that are going to be covered by those need by those uh, technologies first. Yeah, I had a great discussion with Patrick Anderson this week, um, and we were going back and forth on the use cases of AI and machine learning. Take a look at Oshner. They're doing some interesting things, and mm -hmm. take a look at UPMC, obviously, uh, both of which are doing some interesting things with uh, Microsoft. And then two weeks ago, we talked to Halamka, who was doing some interesting things on the AWS cloud. So anyway, the last question I want to ask you is, uh, what's one area that you think CIOs need to be really focused in on right now? Patient experience. Okay. Consumer, uh, but hyper consumerism is where I would focus it more because patient experience to me is a, a banner and a campaign and a this and a that. No, hyper consumerism, driving everything to a digital experience because if we don't make it easy for patients like ourselves to use healthcare on our smart devices, then people like, I shouldn't say people, companies like Apple are starting to do it for us. Right. And, um, yeah, I, this is going to sound like a little bit of a commercial, so I won't mention my company again, but uh, essentially what we talk to people about is, um, you know, actually being intentional about the experience you want your consumers to, to have instead of just allowing it to happen and going, oh, well, you know, that's just their experience. But really un identifying those points, those points of meaning where people go, hey, I got a call back from my primary care physician the next day. And that makes all the difference in the world. And they become loyal to that company and loyal to that organization and that primary care physician for life, just because that's my parents' story. They got a phone call the next day. Uh, she did not have to call them, it was, but she wanted to follow up. And they're like, and she did. She actually moved from one health system to another and they went from one health system to another to follow her. So um, that's great. This was a great uh, discussion. I really appreciate your time. Let's close out uh, last segment where we highlight our social media posts of the week. Uh, I'll go first here. So mine's actually uh, I, not a social media post. It's an obituary from, uh, from the Wall Street Journal, which my, uh, my wife Beth put on my, my desk. And it's just a great story of, uh, you know, we should never retire and always be looking for something to do. It's Jack McConnell, a uh, retired physician, Hilton Head, South Carolina, 1989. He retired. He thought he was going to play some more golf. Uh, and he just started chatting with some people in the neighborhood and he found out that people could not afford health care. And so he went out and found some retired doctors. He put together a program and they started delivering care uh, that picked up steam. And then all of a sudden now they're in uh, 89 affiliated clinics across 28 states. And uh, I think it's just a, an example of a life well lived. And um, I, I just wanted to highlight that, that we have different phases of our career and you know there's the making money phase then there's the giving back phase and then there's the ultra giving back phase where um where i think jack mcconnell really excelled so that's what i'm going to close with what's your uh, social media post mine was that uh, elon musk does not read business books he wrote down he listed the 11 books that he's read that are influential to him and things he likes to think about and what i love you know how you look at certain like uh celebrities in the in, in the industry and you like to either emulate or, or think you're as smart as they are in some cases. And uh, business books are great, but at the mo for the most part, I read war history books. Um, I just think that the whole thing is fascinating in general, but the leadership skills, like right now, I've, I'm really fixated on um, Eisenhower and just learning more and more about him, really the, the deep details. And when you're a continuous learner and you're curious and you apply either biographies or history or whatever, whatever gets you interested in things, um, 
and, and why it motivates you. I thought it's fascinating that he thinks like Lord of the Rings and, and reading, um, one of the things I loved was zero to one about entrepreneurism. I mean, he really focuses on the biographies of people that he has admired and about stories that allow you to do things that seem impossible. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. And so uh, the curiosity, the continuous learning and business books are, can be great, but for the most part, be curious about something other than what's happening around you every single day. Yeah, zero to one, great book and uh, good advice. That and listen to podcasts, I guess. Um, yes, both in that planet, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's all for now. So, uh, so Sarah, tell us how people can follow you and, 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 you know, shout out to your podcast as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, LinkedIn, Sarah Richardson uh, on Twitter, I'm at concierge leader. I have a website, conciergeleadership.com. I do blogging, book reviews, podcasts, uh, and I am currently the chair for marketing and communications for Southern California chapter of Hems. So we do have our own podcast channel on iTunes. We feature a new industry leader every month and you can find us on iTunes at SoCal Hems. Sounds good. Awesome. Uh, you can follow uh, you can follow me on Twitter at the Patient CIO. My writing on Health Lyrics website, Health System CIO, also picks up my stories. And don't forget to follow the show uh, on Twitter. This week in Health IT, uh, I'm sorry, this week in HIT. Health IT was too long. Uh, and check out our new website, thisweekinhealthit.com. If you like the show, please take a few seconds and review us on iTunes or Google Play. And uh, please check out our YouTube channel. We will uh, cut up the show into one, two, three minute segments we put it all out on youtube and and then we post it throughout the week in social media but it, social media sometimes you don't see all those now there's uh, almost 60 of these kinds of videos out there please check us out if you like it uh, please subscribe that would be great and it would help us out uh, please come back every friday for more news commentary and information from industry influencers that's all for now <laughs>